Greetings. My name is Kevin Regick, and I welcome you to Conversations from the Hot Box. Before we get into our main topic, I need to explain what it was birthed out of. There was a recent event that had sparked controversy and raised concerns about the growing disrespect towards Christianity. During the opening ceremony of the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris, a drag performance resembling the Last Supper scene from the Bible was presented. <clears throat> the creator of the performance claimed that he simply wanted to express inclusion. However, there are countless other ways to showcase inclusivity. So why did he choose this religion and that particular scene from the Bible? Why didn't they use a scene from the Quran, for example? I think because the Muslims around the world would not stand for it. They wouldn't dumb it down or be sheepish about it. Christianity is one of the world's largest and most practiced religions with millions of faithful believers holding the Bible as sacred. The Last Supper is a significant event in the Bible where Jesus Christ gathered with his disciples to share a meal before his crucifixion. This event is deeply meaningful and holds great importance for Christians all over the world. So when a drag performance was presented, depicting this sacred scene, it understandably stirred uh, among Christians. Some felt that it was disrespectful and inappropriate to use a religious event for entertainment purposes. Others were offended by the mockery of their faith and their belief. It's important to note that this is not an isolating incident. There have been numerous instances where Christianity has been disrespected and ridiculed in popular culture and media. The lack of regard for this religion is concerning. Another aspect for your consideration is the contrast between the demand for tolerance and respect by the individuals who took part in this portrayal and the lack of tolerance and respect shown toward Christians, Christianity, and the faith of Christianity. Again, I must note that it is unlikely that a similar performance would have been accepted or even allowed if it depicted a sacred scene from another religion. This double standard is unacceptable and reflects a growing trend of disrespect towards Christianity. So in light of this event in Paris, I invite you into our conversation. Check it out. Today's conversation addresses Jesus' statement that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So jump in the car and let's ride. This conversation was birthed as I was sharing with the group that America was not purposed to be a Christian nation. It was purposed to be a nation that would be tolerant of all religious faiths and beliefs, a nation that would provide its citizens options to accept such beliefs or not. And from there, it went to examining all of the religions practiced in America, and then from there to the question of how do we know which one is true or if any are true at all. In the book of John, chapter 14, verses 5 through 6, it states, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by or through me. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. What did he mean by it? Today, we'll be exploring the meaning behind this statement and why it is still relevant to our lives today. Regarding Jesus' declaration that he is the way, the truth, and the life, we see here that the application of the Trinity concept is really a, a further introduced. For example, in that concept, there is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is also body, soul, and spirit. There is also intellect, will, emotions, and now weigh the truth and the life. 
We begin by establishing our relationship with God by way of Jesus, who is the way. We are sustained, strengthened, and matured in that relationship through the word of God, which was made flesh. And we are to stand on and reflect that word of truth. And in doing so, we reflect the light of the sun, enabling us to be light in a dark world. In studying these three dimensions of Jesus, we see that he represents the foundation and purpose of having a relationship with God through him. The title of the early church was actually the way. <laughs> Jesus was emphasizing that he was and is the only way to God. This is the theological essence of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Of this threefold statement of what he is, Jesus explains here only the first, his being the way. Not as if it were in itself more important than the other two, but because the intervention or mediation of Christ between God and men is the distinctive feature of Christianity. That he is the truth and the life or supporting statement. He is the way to the Father primarily because his death made access to the Father's presence possible for sinful human beings. Is Jesus the only way to God? An often heard disagreement with Christianity is, I quote, Jesus and Christianity are fine, and it is great that you have a way to God, but I have my own way and the Muslim has his way, and the Buddhist has his way. All roads lead to God if we are sincere in seeking him, unquote. If a Christian objects to such a statement, they are often met with the reply that, what right do you have to send me to hell just because I don't believe in Jesus as you do? And how Christians respond to that is critical. The scripture tells us that in times of trouble, challenges, and adversities, God can make a way out of no way. One can reason that uh, uh, he can do that, Jesus can do that rather, because he is the way. When we speak that statement, the word the is stressed to indicate that someone or something is the best known or most important of that name or type. The type we're referring to is the way. Way refers to any method, course of action, uh, process, procedure, strategy, plan, or system. As Christians, we believe that uh, uh, belief and acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior is the purpose, original, and distinct course of action and process to a lasting relationship with God. Now, some believe and accept Jesus as a great prophet of God, but Jesus is more than a prophet. He is the son of God, the actual mediator between God and man. He provides the means of having a relationship with God. No other religion or proclaimed prophet or messenger uh, proclaims the ability to do so. And that makes what makes this so important, excuse me, is this. Matthew 7, 21, 23 records Jesus' words warning us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus exposed those people who sounded religious and did religious deeds, but have no personal relationship with him. Claims to be great uh, uh, and have great power uh, are invoking the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you know, we invoke his name. Uh, those things will be no guarantee for anybody getting into heaven. Jesus will send away those who do not know him personally. 
they have done great and impressive deeds. They've, they've delivered great messages. They taught great lessons. But Jesus will say, I never knew you. In other words, I never had a personal relationship with you. And I never went with you to do these deeds you claim. And therefore, you have no part in my kingdom. Yes, <laughs> it is very restrictive but also very obvious that Jesus believed that only through a personal relationship with himself can one know God. And this has often been called the exclusiveness scandal of Christianity. There is no middle ground here. Jesus' exclusive claim is unmistakable. It forces an unconditional response. Jesus invites people to accept or reject him, making it clear that partial acceptance is rejection. His self-description invalidates alternative plans of salvation. Now, some say that a single way is entirely too restrictive, but that position fails to see the desperate state of the human condition. That there is a way at all is evidence of God's grace and love. The fact that Christ is the way does not depend on his physical presence. That would be a major lesson for the disciples to learn. When they could no longer see him in the flesh, they still had to walk with him. So he promised them another counselor. The word counselor means helper or advocate. And he would come to them and be comforter and teacher. He would be with them as the Holy Spirit, the same way he had been with them as Jesus, the Messiah, or Jesus the Christ. All references to the Holy Spirit in this chapter are made in the terms of I and he, never it, because the Holy Spirit is not a ghost, is not an it, he is a person. When Jesus says, I am the way, he is talking about our journey through life as well. He is saying that he is the path that we should follow. So, oh, so often we get lost in the distractions and temptations of the world. We try to find our own way and end up going deeper into the woods and lost. Jesus is telling us that he is the way we should walk on, the guy that leads us to the right destination. If Jesus is the way, then Christianity must be the way. It is not therefore strange that this was the first title by which believers were called, according to Acts 9 and 2 and 19 and 23. Christianity is the way. Not a way of doing certain things, but a way of doing everything. It's a way of life. Jesus also said he is the truth. The term truth in Greek philosophy had the connotation of truth versus falsehood or reality versus illusion. In a world where there are so many voices and opinions, it can be hard to discern what is true and what is not. Jesus offers us the truth, the ultimate truth that comes from God himself. He shows us what is right and what is wrong and guides us toward living in alignment with the will of God. The Apostle Paul said that the truth is in Jesus in Ephesians 4.21. Now there is a danger of treating truth as something to know in a merely academic way. Far from being an academic expression of truth, he is the truth for a vital purpose to bring us back to God in relationship and original intent. Now, I like the Peanuts cartoons, and I was reminded of one where uh, the whole Peanut gang was returning to school from summer break. And during the first day of class, they had to share their essays about what they did over the summer. Reading from her essay, Lucy wrote, vacations are nice, but it's good to get back to school. There is nothing more satisfying or challenging than education. And I look forward to a year of expanding knowledge. 
when she was finished, Charlie Brown with a dis dismayed look on his face, uh, uh, just looked at her. And Lucy walks up to him and stated, you learn what sells after a while. Now that's a pretty good description of what has happened to our society from the classroom to the boardroom to politics and religion, saying what is perceived as what others want to hear, whether it is true or not, has become the go-to. We have become a society that no longer believes in the concept of absolute truth. Finally, Jesus says that he is the life. The Gospel of John speaks of Jesus as the life in various ways. It states that in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Jesus speaks as, of himself as the bread of life and as the resurrection and the life. All these statements reflect the fact that Jesus shared the divine life of God. And therefore, when people come to Jesus, they come to the one in whom the life of the Father is found. And in this sense, also, Jesus is the way to the Father. Now the method of obtaining life is to become new creatures. He declares that we ought not to seek it anywhere else and at the same time he reminds us that he is the way by which alone we can arrive at it. In a church I was uh, a member of, uh, we would declare uh, uh, we believe it, that settles it, amen. Now, I know that statement is fine among believers, but in a discussion with non-believers, it falls short. As ambassadors, we need to be able to provide a little more content to the statement and the argument. Sometimes people object and say, I believe Jesus was an honest man, and, and I believe he was a true prophet, but I don't actually believe he said those things about himself in the gospel. I actually once took that position. I believe Christians added those things in later on by themselves, but there is no objective reason for a person to make a distinction between Jesus re really said this or Jesus really didn't say that. We have no ancient text showing us uh, uh, just the supposedly true sayings of Jesus. Any such distinction is purely based on personal opinions and reasoning. To take it a step further, remember scripture tells us that narrow is the way. It is not enough to merely believe in Jesus. That is narrow enough. The Bible also tells us the atoning work of Jesus on the cross was the only way salvation could be accomplished. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his death, Jesus prayed, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus asked the Father if there was any other way to accomplish the salvation of man other than his atoning work on the cross, other than him drinking the cup representing the wrath of God poured out upon him at our place. Let it be done. But there was no other way. Does this, make, does this make Christianity bigoted? Certainly not. Now, yes, there are some who claim to be Christian who are in fact bigots and racists. But biblical Christianity is the most pluralistic, tolerant, and embracing of all cultures, uh, uh, religions on earth. In fact, Christianity is rather pluralistic. It is the one religion to embrace other cultures and has the most urgency to translate the scriptures into other languages. A Christian can keep their native language and culture and follow Jesus in the midst of it. An early criticism of Christianity was the observation that they would take anybody, <laughs> slave or free, rich or poor, man or woman, Greek or barbarian, all were accepted, but on the common ground of the truth as revealed in Jesus. To leave that common ground is spiritual suicide. 
Now there is what is known as the two covenant theology. It was pioneered in this century by a non-Masiatic Jewish philosopher named Franz Rosenweg. And since it has been elaborated by some liberal Christian theologians, this theory holds that the Jewish people were brought close to God by means of the covenant with Abraham and the Torah of Moses. So they have no need to come to the Father through Jesus or anyone else because they are already with him. Now, accordingly, Jesus' word is not for Jews, but for Gentiles and is to be understood as a quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no Gentile comes to the Father except through me. The two covenant theory enables the Jewish community to live in apparent peace, from his own point of view anyway, with his Christian neighbors by alleviating the pressure on Judaism to downgrade Jesus, the New Testament and Christianity. And for non-Messianic Jews can say, we Jews have our way, Judaism, and you Gentiles have your way, Christianity. We will each serve God best by following the way provided for us. It is a manifestation of God's grace that he has provided Jesus for you Gentiles and the Torah for us Jews. Thus, Jesus can be held in high regard because his claims are not taken as posing any threat to the structure of non-Messianic Judaism. Unfortunately for this theory, it does not fit the New Testament facts at all. But Jesus was a Jew who presented himself to Jews, and these Jews remained Jewish after they came to trust in Jesus. He rarely presented the gospel to Gentiles. Indeed, it was only with difficulty and supernatural intervention that his Jewish disciples came to realize that Gentiles could join God's people through trusting Jesus without uh, converting to Judaism. In his letter to the Romans, the apostle Paul states that salvation through Jesus is God's good news to the Jew especially. However, since he was stressing that Gentiles too may be part of the people of God, he immediately adds, but equally to the Gentiles in Romans 8, uh, in Romans 1.16. Now I know that in this current culture in America, it is okay to distort truth as alternative facts, but that doesn't work with God and his word. He has clearly declared, I am the way, the truth and the life. What say you? Well, I hope you enjoyed the ride today. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation. Otherwise, thank you for spending some of your time with me. Please take a second to uh, like this post, share it with family and friends, and subscribe to this channel for more uh, similar content. And as always, peace and blessings to you and your household.